Hi, I'm James Walker, Senior Editor of Data Center Knowledge, coming to you live from the news desk here at Data Center World 2024 in Washington, DC. I'm here today with Vlad Galabov, Research Director at Omdia. Vlad, thanks so much for joining us. No problem. Um, unsurprisingly, AI has been a recurring topic across uh, Data Center World uh, this, this week. And I noticed that the CEO of JP Morgan Chase, Jamie Dimon, recently said that AI could be as transformational as the printing press and the steam engine. Do you agree with this prediction? And are you optimistic that the industry will be able to evolve to satisfy the predicted surge in demand for AI? I absolutely think that it is, no, there's no question that this is the next industry revolution. Um, I think it's not new, it started a few years ago. Uh, particularly predictive AI. Predictive AI is the field of AI techniques around computer vision, natural language processing. It includes um, machine learning, deep learning. We use those uh, techniques already. We already have object detection deployed in industry. We already have face recognition deployed. In our day-to-day -day lives, most of us open our phone with uh, our face. So it is already something that happens. Um, however, however, predictive uh, generative AI is Come, take this a step further from predictive AI. It doesn't make predictive AI obsolete. It just allows us to significantly increase our productivity. Okay. So, for example, I mean, already predictive AI enabled me to open my phone in a second. So imagine what will happen when generative AI in a second gives you a starting set of questions that then you can edit when we're talking. I mean, right. it will be significant saving. So, and this is just one of a million use cases. Um, so. I'll give you just one random example because I thought it was so interesting and I think it's on a topic that we wanted to speak about anyway, but yeah. Intel and TSMC and NVIDIA have an idea of how now they can run a semiconductor facility in, the, um, in a digital twin. So what they're saying is one of the hardest parts of the semiconductor industry is actually trial and error. It's a trial and error business. And it's so hard. A dust particle could end up breaking a wafer so as a result, what they're going to do is they're going to basically, in a digital twin, test how they can end up creating a factory and then um, end up actually producing in, in that environment. As wow. a result, they're probably going to ask generative AI to create certain disruptions and, and yep. certain uh, options. And then they're going to also use predictive AI as they analyze some of their findings, which I think is so wow. interesting. Wow. It's like applying multiple different AI techniques at the same time. So okay. absolutely, it's real. Um, it is going to be a bit of a challenge from a power capacity perspective. Sure. I think we already know that. But I do think that there are ways to fix it. Um, and do you want me to give you my view of how we can fix it? Of course. So um, I think first, there will definitely be a consolidation of the existing server install base. Mm -hmm. The reality is that when we started deploying servers, a general purpose design made sense. Um, and it made sense because it was efficient. That means that you design once and you deploy many times. Mm -hmm. What's happened by now is there are certain applications in the world that are very large scale. So YouTube is probably the best example of how you have a singular very large scale application. Google every year buys thousands, hundreds of thousands of servers for, for um, YouTube. So what Google figured out is now that I know what is it that these servers do the most, the most is video encoding, what I can do is I can create an application-specific processor that is just for encoding, that does that one thing very well. Okay. You know, it can't power a server, it can't run uh, a database, it can't run a lot of things, but that video encoding can do it at the best possible performance. So what then Google did is now I'll put 12 of those in a server, I, I'm suddenly significantly increasing the amount of how much YouTube I can run on one server. So then during the refresh, and this is really what I think is the, the dramatic change that will happen. During the refresh, you end up changing several of the existing servers with one. So 5.1 okay. could be, I think, one of the optimal changes in, in YouTube. Something similar will happen in IT because now Intel CPU has 288 cores. Intel CPU from Ten years, uh, five years ago, had 28 cores. So now you're suddenly able to consolidate your databases as well, your general kind of purpose workload. So I think this, there will be a big um, consolidation of uh, general purpose IT, and that will enable, once we've consolidated and we've freed up power, now let's get AI uh, deployed. 
this will be a, a really big thing. I think we're also going to see improvement in utilization in, of computing. We're underutilizing our IT resources. Um, there's many things that we can do, software optimization. There's um, even changing patterns of how we get built. So serverless is an example where another company decides for you. And then I do think that PUE is going to get significantly kind of new pressure is going to come on PUE. I think there's going to be government mandates, so yes. regulations. I don't know if you guys have had a chance to talk about it, but in China, there's a regulation of 1.3 PUE is the maximum in Shanghai. In um, Germany, we saw a PUE of 1.2 mandated for 2027. And I think that where it's not government mandated, you have the leadership team of data center operators mandated. Why? Yep. Because if you lower your PUE, you can deploy more AI clusters. And then as a result, that gives you a competitive advantage. Okay. So I do think that first, it's a real kind of opportunity and we can also power it. Because then I, I had to tell you that because I feel like people are concerned about that. Yes. They think you're just saying, oh, this is great, but it's not achievable. It is achievable, absolutely. Okay, fantastic. Um, you mentioned um, during the analyst summit earlier this week that uh, IT consolidation will be a key element in, in the industry's quest to, to satisfy these growing power demands. Um, I guess it's partly due to more efficient chips taking up less space. And I was just wondering, where does Moore's law fit into all this? This is where, I guess, the number of transistors crammed into a, a microchip will double every two years. Yes. But could we eventually reach a point where we physically can't get any smaller? And if so, would that mean we have to turn to the other areas that you've mentioned mm. in order to scale? Or do you think by that point we'll have a, a fundamentally different data center mm. hardware market? Uh, Moore's Laws um, uh, is the biggest debate in the industry. I, I actually really <laughs> love talking about it yeah. um, because I come from Intel, um, as you know, and you know Moore's Law is almost a part of my DNA at this point. So, yeah. I do, so first, I personally believe that Moore's Law is a lie. The reason why I believe it's a lie is because NVIDIA just unleashed a 200 billion transistor C GPU. I yeah. mean, that is the vision that, that Gordon Moore had. Um, I think that from a computational perspective, we are meeting Moore's Law. There's, and, and I do think that we have a few years still. You know, we might need to get creative. We might need to get creative in packaging. We might need to get creative in, you know, how we even combine different chiplets together. Mm -hmm. But I personally do think that in, if the question is, can one integrated circuit have more transistors? I think the answer is yes, and it's happening. The one thing that people forget is when Gordon Moore analyzed the first processors to make his prediction that ended up becoming the law of the industry, the processors were already getting larger in size, they were already getting higher in thermal consumption. And he never said that as we're able to integrate more transistors on an integrated circuit, they won't also get hotter. Right. So I think, I do think that Moore's Law will enable our applications but at the same time, it does mean that we have to have certain innovation in, for example, cooling, because it, I believe it's inevitable that processors will get bigger and hotter. And a couple of years ago, I decided to test this. I made this prediction of where the CPU roadmap will go by analyzing the first kind of 60, 70 years. Mm -hmm. And at the time, I anticipated that Intel's next GPU will be 500 watts. I just met with Intel's team in Phoenix last week. They showed me the Sierra Forest uh, CPU, and it is 500 watts. Wow. So I, I really think that this pace of growth of, of power consumption increases, but you can do much more in then that small package. So mm -hmm. that is important because even if we have to be creative with cooling, maybe we can do more with the space that we have. And space is an issue in the world right now. <laughs> yeah, sure. Thank you so much. Um, Vlad, thank you. thank you very much for your insight. Uh, I've been James Walker for Data Center Knowledge. Um, you, you've given us plenty of food for thought. I know it's an issue we could, we could carry on talking about for, for, a, for a long time to come, but it's going to be really interesting to see how this plays out. So thank you again for your thank time. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank you.